What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Code. Again, I'm your host, Dr. Andrew Fix from Physio Room. And today we're joined by Dr. Ben Weatherford. He is a faculty member and instructor with Owens Recovery Science, calling in to talk to us this morning from near the San Antonio, Texas area. Ben, thanks so much for joining me today on The Code. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, well, we were just chatting a little bit off air, um, you know, getting to know each other because, you know, you and I, unlike some of the other people we've talked with on this show, haven't had the opportunity to work together or anything like that. But both being physical therapists for probably a very similar amount of time, um, you know, just based on our ages and whatnot, I'm excited to get into the topic of blood flow restriction training with you. Um, would you be so kind to give us a little bit of a background about yourself? You know, like, where are you from? Where'd you do your training? And how did you get into uh, working with Owens Recovery Science? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I went to school all, uh, all over Texas. I kind of bounced around for undergrad and played tennis in college. Uh, thought I was going to be a, a professional tennis player for my career. Right. And uh, turns out there's a lot of people that are really good at tennis. Uh, so I, you know, it's one of those things where it was, it was fun to try and I, I did okay, but it wasn't going to pay the bills. Um, so I, I got back into school for, for physical therapy, um, worked for a little while at some PT clinics just to gain some experience as a tech, and, you know, the kind of typical route for a lot of folks pre-PT. Um, worked as a strength coach for a little while as well. And uh, once my, my wife finished her master's, I actually got into PT school and, and did PT school in the San Antonio area at a school called University of the Incarnate Word, uh, which everyone down here calls UIW. So I was part of the, the first class that went through there, uh, which was, was interesting. It was a problem-based learning program. And so not, not much lecture and mm. it worked, worked well for me. And, and luckily, um, my wife works with the military folks here in San Antonio. She's yep. held a few different positions uh, as a rec therapist and does adaptive sports. And so she actually uh, got me in to do some shadowing with the military. And I, I figured out before PT school that I wanted to do some work with the military. And, and that was what I thought I was going to do was try to get a position working with the military in San Antonio. And I had actually shadowed this guy named Johnny Owens. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turns out whenever I, I got my last rotation for school. It was at a place called the Center for the Intrepid in San Antonio, which is the, the crown jewel for rehab for the military. It's an amazing place and it ruined me forever. <laughs> and uh, I mean, it, it was every toy you could possibly imagine and um, spent some more time with, with Johnny. And I figured out that I, I wasn't necessarily just trying to work with the military. I really wanted to work with, with Johnny. I mean, he was doing some really cool things as far as research yeah. Um, and, and he had really improved a lot of what the military was doing for orthopedic rehab there at the Center for the Intrepid. So um, right place, right time. You know, I, I spent some time uh, working with him for my last rotation and he was uh, looking to start his own business. So I, I just, you know, stayed in his ear and luckily became his first employee for this company. So, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, right at about six and a half years now working for, for Owens Recovery Science and uh, teaching for about six of those. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, we'll dive into that. When did you, um, at UIW, when did you get out of PT school? And you said you're in the first class of first, that program. Yeah, first class. So it was one of those where it's like, well, we're, we think we're going to get accreditation for yeah. this. Um, right. And so it was, uh, it was interesting. And I finished PT school in 2015. Okay. So that was yep. when I graduated and worked for a hospital system for a little while uh, here in San Antonio and then started working with Johnny. All right. Yeah. So we actually graduated from PT school the same, same uh, year in 2015. Um, so you said it's been like six and a half years that you've been working for Owens Recovery Science. When do you know when did did Johnny start the, the company? Like how long has ORS been been established? It's it's probably right at seven years. Okay. So Johnny started doing um, some teaching on his own. You know, before he hired me, I think he mm -hmm. wanted to make sure it was a model that he could really sustain. Sustain, yeah. Yeah, and so he he had started um, teaching some courses mainly for professional sports teams. Um, once he you know got out of working with the military, and so that was um, really a, a cool thing to see the you know branch out from from military to basically going directly to professional sports. 
as far as a target audience. And I think that that really helped grow what we do now with the education. So, yeah. And, you know, part of that through probably your guys' education platform and and course offerings is how we wound up getting connected. So we have one of the Owens uh, Delphi blood flow restriction units in our clinic here that I'm sitting in, in our owner of physio room, his name is Chris. I believe he actually went through one of your guys' courses at some point Mm -hmm. in time. And I think that's how we ended up, ended up getting one of the devices and, you know, we have the opportunity to use it. But it's so interesting hearing, like hearing you talk about, you know, the professional sports side, the military side. So often there are a lot more, you know, tools at the disposal of the providers in those settings than what most normal people, right? Everyday people have access to. And slowly we're starting to see some of those things become a little bit more readily available. This being being one of those things. Right. Yeah, it was that was definitely an experience with the military that, you know, it was obviously the funding was good um, and just the ability to do things that the average outpatient clinician can't, you know, you have less constraints because you're not fighting for insurance reimbursements. You you kind of do what you need to do to get people back to function and everyone's paid for because they're property of the government. So it's, you know, do you need five days a week? Do you need three days a week, once a week? You know, it's basically whatever that needed to look like for the individual. And that was, that was a really cool thing. Plus it was, interdisciplinary the way it, it potentially could be in an ideal world where yeah. the funding didn't matter as much. Yep. Uh, so it was, it was definitely um, cool to see that. And then going to work for, for a hospital based system here for a little while. Um, it it kind of showed me that I didn't necessarily want to do that long-term. So yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. Like, it's like night and day, like the the experience in from from both the uh, you know employee or provider side in some of these different settings, as well as from the from the client or patient side of things. Um, yeah. You know we we see that every day, um, and you know I think having the opportunity to to utilize some of these tools that that maybe help um, you know stave off some of those feelings of burnout or things where you're just not stuck in the rut, just doing the same thing all the time, uh, probably probably helps. So um, when was you, when would you say was your, was it while you were shadowing with Johnny when you had your first experience, like utilizing blood flow restriction? Absolutely. Yeah. As, as an intern, um, it really, I, I don't remember doing it whenever I shadowed Johnny before PT school, although I know they were utilizing it then. Yeah. Um, you know, I was only there for, for probably three days. And so the exposure was, um, it was really fascinating. I mean, at that time, it was kind of um, height of, of blast trauma coming back from OIF and OEF. So the population yeah. there was was very different than anything I had seen anywhere else. Um, and so, yeah, whenever I was interning with Johnny, um, I, I really got exposed to BFR because it was more of a staple at that point in time, as far as what they were using, just to try and figure out how do we regain strength after some of these injuries that are not the typical orthopedic post-op patients. And uh, so, yeah, they, they have fun um, messing with interns a little bit whenever we're, we're playing around with something like blood flow sure. restriction. So yeah, first, first exercise I ever tried was a, a knee extension exercise, you know, a little pin selected knee extension. Um, and, and I was a, uh, you know, glorified meathead in, in PT school. So um, it was, it was something around, you know, 20 to 30 pounds where, where I was like, oh yeah, no big deal. Uh, single leg, no, no problem. And then they put the, the tourniquet on me and it was, it was a different experience. It was a yeah. com- complete failure in, in the third set. And so, um, that, that really piqued my interest in, in something like blood flow restriction to see how different of an exercise experience it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's almost hard to, uh, to explain to someone what it feels like if they've not tried it before, or if you, or if you've not tried it, like it's almost impossible to explain truly what it feels like. Um, Okay. So for everybody listening to this, could you just give us kind of like a, a base level of uh, knowledge, understanding of like, what is BFR, you know, how does it work and how does it get utilized? Absolutely. So blood flow restriction or BFR from the simplest stance is a strategy for exercise to try to replicate what happens when we lift heavy or do high intensity. So that's our, our gold standard for making muscle adapt is to move really fast or lift really heavy 
and try to go to failure. And that's really what we know is effective for muscle. So if you do that, you get these, you know, shifts in oxygen availability. If you lift heavy, your muscle contracts hard enough where we limit or completely restrict blood flow in the limbs that are exercising. And so we, we start to see this buildup of metabolites or this acidity, this lactate and hydrogen that we feel that big, bad burn with exercise, mm -hmm. part of exercise that we all know and hate. And that seems to be a, a big part of what tells your brain that, okay, we're, we're under significant stress. We need to adapt to this. So mm -hmm. in rehab, the exercises that we're able to do a lot of times don't create that same kind of response. You know, a lot of times we're left with low intensity exercise because people are in pain, they have post surgical precautions, whatever that might be. And so we apply a tourniquet to a limb and we try to go proximal on the limb because that seems to be the best place to put it. And it's all plumbing. So if you restrict it on the, the proximal part close to the hip or close to the shoulder, it's restricted everywhere else. And if you restrict blood flow, it looks like we can do a much lower intensity of exercise and get a response that's somewhat similar to lifting heavy. So it's yeah. basically just lowering the threshold of how much weight you have to lift to make it seem like you're doing something really heavy. Yeah. You know, I love the way that you kind of laid that out because when I get asked by a client or someone else, that's virtually exactly what I say too. Like, this is a way that we can try to simulate the effects of higher intensity exercise while doing lower intensity exercise, but we're using the tourniquet system to try to create that, that same type of effect. And just like Ben said, you know, trying to place that proximal on the limb or closer to the body, as opposed to closer to the hand or to the foot, um, you know, seems to be the most effective. So, um, you know, with, now this got created or, or the studies that you were talking about were more in people injured from like blast injuries, having true, like full limb injuries. Um, and isn't that how like some of the early studies of BFR came to be and saw that it was being successful? You know, it, it really goes back a lot further than that. Yeah, so okay. it, in, you know, a lot of the, the stories that I hear told about where BFR gets its start, um, there's a really interesting marketing story that a company called Katsu uses. And, and Katsu has been around for a while in the BFR world. Um, I mean, they've been putting out research uh, since the late 80s, early 90s, as far as I, I know. Um, and what's really interesting is this goes back a lot further than that. So yeah. you can find research going back to the 1930s, looking at putting a, something like a blood pressure cuff on a limb and just doing intermittent venous occlusion to look at things like wound healing or, you know, where I see some of the early exercise application of this, it's really them putting a cuff on a limb to study hemodynamic changes or changes in blood pressure and heart rate that happen whenever you start to restrict blood flow. And, you know, how does that change the effect? And then it's, you know, you can find research going through, you know, from then on, um, there's a little bit of a gap you know, from that kind of 1930s time frame until, you know, you get more BFR stuff in the eighties, starting to see, you know, outcomes that are improved with exercise and it's mainly physiology based research. So healthy people right. that they're just looking at, what does this do? Does this replicate lifting heavy? It's potentially easier to put a tourniquet on someone and recreate an anaerobic limb than making them lift really hard. So, right. um, you know, for, for our purposes, you know, I, I kind of cling on to the, the military story. Um, really, it was looking for whatever strategy we can find to rehab people after trauma, because, you know, some of the problems we see with orthopedic injuries or, you know, orthopedic surgeries are, are amplified in something like a traumatic injury. You know, we have these issues with, trying to get muscle to respond because yeah. the, the big problem that was, was seen in these populations is even further out from the injury or surgery, you just can't tolerate the heavy lifting. Like right. we, we think we need to make muscle respond. So is there an alternative strategy? And, you know, luckily there was some good research that this blood flow restriction idea looks pretty darn effective mm -hmm. for lightweight exercise. And that's, that's really what we have available a lot of times in a rehab setting. So, yeah. 
Yeah, not every clinic is uh, is set up like like our. Well, I should say not every clinic. Most clinics are not set up like like the one that I'm fortunate to be a part of here at Physio Room, where we've got squat racks and barbells and tons of plates. And we, you know, we have not come across a client yet that we don't have enough weight for if, you know, if we want to load them up, but that's mm-hmm. not how most settings are. You know, the, yeah. the world that I came from, we did have a, a cable column machine that went up to, I think the stack was 200 pounds on each side, one of those like life fitness brands. But, um, but in terms of like free weight that wasn't attached to the cable machine, I think the heaviest we had was 25 pound dumbbells. Um, and you know, we had the, the set of ankle weights that go to 10 pounds and a little colorful, uh, TheraBand and all this stuff, like not enough yeah. to truly create load to a tissue. Um, and you know, we see people doing a lot of clamshells and things laying on their side on the table, uh, like that is supposed to strengthen to the point where their, their leg is going to be able to support their, their pelvis and stuff while they're up walking around, uh, on a 200 pound adult body. So, yep. um, you know, we just can't simulate some of that stuff, but, um, you know, you could hop on the internet, right. And you could type in blood flow restriction or blood BFR cuffs or something like that. And you're going to find a lot of different options of things all the way from, you know, one electronic devices, like the one that we have in the office, all the way to just like straight up Velcro straps or bands or things that you can just like put on and just, you know, just kind of guess, guesstimate how, how tight is this, and a lot of times, you know, I'll see people just in the gym, like some, some guys, maybe they're training for a, a bodybuilding show or something and they're strapping BFR cuffs on and they're doing their curls. Um, so will you kind of like explain to us, like if someone was going to, because they're readily available, if mm-hmm. someone was going to maybe on their own, you know, own decision, not in a physical therapy clinic or something, utilize a tool like this, what is a way that they can go about that safely and, you know, avoid doing something detrimental to themselves and and causing any harm? Yeah. So I I get that question a lot. And um, for me, it's something that trying to approach it from um, a scientific standpoint, Mm -hmm. it it really looks like from the research that I've come across and from the recommendations that are put out in in medical settings, uh, the best way to approach restricting blood flow on a limb is first off to start with, with something that is wider, right? So if we're looking at a cuff that's made for putting on a limb, the wider the cuff, typically the lower the pressure you can use to restrict blood flow. So mm-hmm. as you start getting into things that are more narrow, you need a higher pressure sure. and then you're creating this higher pressure in a smaller surface area. So you're, you're increasing the way that pressure is translated to the soft tissue underneath it so the typically the wider the cuff the the lower the pressure you can use and it really looks like lower pressures are likely going to be safer for the soft tissue and and that's the biggest concern that seems to be there is what's happening to the soft tissue underneath the cuff you look at the old um not really that old but you look at tourniquet literature and the risks that that are there Um, You know, there were risks for things like nerve palsies and nerve related injuries from too high of a pressure that was there for too long. So um, wider cuffs, lower pressure, shorter doses of cuff pressure seem to be kind of the best way to avoid any soft tissue based injuries. There's research out there on trying to estimate cuff pressure with a a rating system, something like a a zero to 10 scale on pressure and there's been some research to suggest that that can be effective. And I, I think it probably can be effective, but it doesn't seem to be that accurate. It's not something that we can really reproduce in a consistent way because the way people perceive tightness is going to change based on their experience yeah. with it. The more frequently you do it, the probably the, the lower you will rate the relative tightness because it's not so awkward to have a cuff on your limb anymore. Yeah. It seems very subjective and hard to, hard to like mass produce this over a large scale. Right. And so, you know, off air, you had mentioned something that I I think some groups are starting to turn to, which is using something computerized and having an accurate application of cuff pressure while someone is in a clinical setting, if you can, and then saying, okay, here's kind of what this should feel like. Maybe you can try and recreate this in some fashion on your own based on what this felt like to you. And and maybe that's a a better way to go about, you know, 
applying the pressure than just saying, okay, we'll try and shoot for a seven out of 10 on tightness or something along those lines. I think the, the best way would be to measure some sort of occlusion pressure if you can, which I don't know that many people are going to do that at home, Mm -hmm. you know, doing a a little Doppler based measurement on themselves. If they have the ability or the training to do a a Doppler and do it relatively accurately. Um, it, it does get kind of awkward if you have a, a hand pump cuff to try and be, you know, working a little sphygma manometer bulb and working yeah. a, a Doppler on your own. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's what's really cool is in the literature, it looks like there's a broad range of things that can be effective. You know, mm, there's okay. there's research with arbitrary pressures applied to everyone in the study. And, and that's been effective for making muscle bigger and stronger or improving endurance based outcomes. Um, you know, obviously for us in the clinic, I think the more we can get objective and be really specific with the way that we do it, it's probably better for the outcome and for the patient. Um, yeah. so I, I think, you know, it's one of those where if nothing else, use a wider cuff, if you can, uh, I think if you use knee wraps uh, or bands, you, you kind of run the risk of having one band really tight compared to the others. So it might be difficult to get a consistent pressure that's kind of edge to edge on the way on where you're applying it. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, use, use a a lowest effective dose of pressure if you can. And that's probably going to be the safest way you do it on your own. Yeah. And I, I, I resonate really well with that, that lowest or minimal effective dose mindset of, you know, that's, that's how I try to approach most things, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, me doing some sort of uh, spinal or other joint manipulation on a client with a client or dry needling or whatever that might be like, what is the lowest amount that we can do to still get the effect we're looking for while we do the other things, the movement based, the exercise type of things. Um, and to, uh, to sort of fill you guys that are listening to this in on the, the story, Ben and I were talking about off air was, you know, we have a client who we're utilizing blood flow restriction training with, to try to rehab his knee. He has a partial ligament tear inside his knee and his PCL. And, um, you know, whenever we try to do exercise that feels challenging for him in the clinic in a particular fashion to strengthen his hamstrings and things where he's pulling, like bending his knee against some resistance, he gets this deep within the knee, knee pain. That's like reproducing, um, what we think is potentially stressing that, that PCL a little bit. So anyways, um, or if he kneels down and there's pressure pushing backwards on his tibia or on his lower leg, he gets knee pain. But so we've used BFR to try and use lower doses or lower intensity of exercise to stimulate some strengthening for him at an intensity that doesn't cause that knee pain. But I was a little hesitant to just send him home, um, not being someone who has like a really, um, like a really good routine of exercise. You know, he, he just, goes to work, comes home. He has a very busy work, work life, um, but he doesn't spend a lot of time in the gym. Um, so just like, you know, Ben was saying his ability to self rate, like, you know, how tight is this pressure? Um, he hasn't had much experience with that. So what I encouraged him to do was come over to our other clinic location where we have, um, a blood flow restriction unit that's, you know, electronic and can measure the pressure. It has nice wide cuffs. Like Ben was just saying, and try to just feel and estimate like, okay, how tight is this? How tight does the machine say this pressure should be? And try to simulate that at home with the bands that, that we encourage to buy um, that are more, you know, elastic wrapping type of bands rather than like a Velcro strap. Very easy to take off in the event. He starts feeling like it's too tight. He can pop it right off. Um, but try to simulate that to the pressure he felt in the clinic. And then if he feels like he's, you know, struggling with that, well, then we'll get him back in the clinic and, and do another session in here. Um, but so far that seems to be, to be going well. Um, like with most things, I think it's awesome that you said so far in the research, it pretty much shows, you know, there's a lot of different ranges that seem to be effective. Well, and that to me just sounds like, like most exercise, there's a lot of different forms of exercise that people do that are effective for helping people get more endurance, stronger, faster, uh, build muscle. I mean, whether we're talking about high rep ranges, low rep ranges with heavier weights, CrossFit, other high intensity stuff. I mean, you know, there's a lot of ways we could go about accomplishing our goals. And I think it's cool that the BFR research kind of shows the same thing that consistency is going to win out over the, like, you know, the most important way to do it. 
Yeah, and I think we see things with BFR that are just very consistent with exercise prescription, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it the dose necessary depends on the individual. You know, what is their training history? If they're a lesser trained individual, then you know, you can probably get away with a, you know, an even lower intensity and a lower cuff pressure because any stimulus is going to be significant for them. Um, and, and that's where, you know, there also from the literature seems to be a trade-off in how much pressure you need from the cuff and how much intensity you need from the exercise. You know, the lower the exercise intensity, the more important a, a specific cuff pressure probably becomes, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're relying on the blood flow restriction to give us something impactful as far as a stimulus. But as exercise intensity picks up, then it, you're really getting more of the effect that the cuff would give you anyway, because yeah. your muscle is creating more of the response for you. So, mm -hmm. you know, if for the at-home use, I think it's probably you know, better to say, you know, I'd rather see you undershoot the cuff pressure a little bit and increase your exercise intensity a little, yeah. as opposed to trying to get a really high cuff pressure when you're on your own at home. So that makes sense. You know, just know it, knowing that that's there and, and really, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's resistance exercise for the most mm -hmm. part, you know, we do endurance based exercise with this, but resistance exercise is what's done most commonly. Yeah. And, you know, we're still looking for similar endpoints to what we get with traditional resistance exercise. We're trying to see that you have, you know, some sort of adequate loading, the lower the load, the higher the volume of reps probably needs to be, you know, and if the, if we're going down that really low load, the high volume of reps and a long time under tension, just like we get with traditional exercise seems to be important and, and trying to get towards something that looks like a fatigue or failure based response with that exercise is still where we need to be just like traditional resistance exercise. So those yeah. things don't really change here. Yeah. I've been trying to sprinkle in a little bit of BFR into the early sets of my training days. So like, for example, um, I'm dealing with a pretty chronic case uh, personally of Achilles tendinopathy um, mm -hmm. with actually a small grade tear in my Achilles as well. And I've been trying to incorporate some BFR, not only with, you know, calf and Achilles strengthening, but just all the rest of my lower extremity work, my leg work. So we were squatting yesterday and we were doing some um, Bulgarian split squats and uh, with the barbell and some uh, heavy unilateral uh, single leg RDLs. So during my early, like not warm up sets, but like I think we did three working sets. So during the first two, I had some uh, BFR going on my upper thigh um, while I'm working at, you know, weights that aren't my peak challenge. Uh, and then as I get to the heavier weights, I strip those off because I'm creating the intensity with, with the load rather than with the BFR. And that seems to be going well. Um, yeah. I, I, you know, not necessarily in that exercise feeling much in my Achilles, but just feeling a higher working demand of all the muscles in my legs, um, while I'm, while I'm utilizing it. So, um, that's been kind of my, my own personal experience, uh, lately, which is, you know, pretty much the bulk of my BFR experience as, as the one using it. Mm -hmm. Um, when you're teaching classes, Ben, and you're getting, you know, questions from people attending, or you're teaching them techniques and ways to use it. What are some of the most common conditions that you guys talk about BFR being used for in the clinical setting? I know the answer is probably pretty broad, but like, if you had to narrow it down to like some of the most common ones, what do you normally uh, end up talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think the the easy place for us to go and the low hanging fruit with this is going to be the the orthopedic patient. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where I, I've seen it used the most commonly. That's where I think the most research is being done. You know, so you look at things like ACL reconstructions. You look at the you know uh, arthroscopic surgeries. You look at things like now we're starting to see a little bit more. Uh, geared toward the the total joint surgeries, <clears throat> and I, I think that's an easy place to justify the use. Yeah. Um, and, and the way I typically talk about it is, you know, just like you're saying, it, it's really broad. I mean, I, I think we initially kind of were pigeonholed a little bit to say this is, you no, know, this is for the the young, healthy, you know, orthopedic patient, and um, I, I think that's that's a great place to use it, but I think it could be used on a, a very broad scale. I think almost anyone 
where exercise is appropriate without significant precautions, then BFR could potentially be used. And it, it's really a tool to be used as you need it if you can't get an adequate exercise intensity otherwise. And so yeah. that's the easiest place to say this makes some sense. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, there may be some other potential for this to be used from a periodization standpoint. Like you were saying, if you've got kind of a chronic injury, then I think this is being used a lot for that. And then the, the question is, you know, do you do it at the beginning? Like you were, you know, using it on yourself, or I could also see it being at, at the end of, of yep. the session as well as a way to get uh, muscle failure. And there's yeah. some really cool research now that's looking at <clears throat> the potential for something like BFR to be used for an analgesic response. And mm, so if you have something like a tendinopathy that is reactive and it hurts to try and get the loading that we know we'd like to see. Yeah. You know, then maybe BFR becomes another effective strategy to say, well, maybe this can be used to create an analgesic response. Maybe this creates a window of opportunity to then go and do a little bit more loading without creating yeah. more of the pain response that we're used to getting. Yeah. And that's, that's my whole uh, thought process right there with, with my own leg is, you know, I think I can, I can pretty much tolerate uh, from a pain standpoint, the load that's probably necessary to generate the tendon changes that we need. I don't get a ton of pain with loading, except for when speed is involved um, mm -hmm. with my Achilles jumping and running related tasks. I can do those things. There's just a little bit of pain. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm a little bit, you know, mentally just like a little concerned about tearing it since there is a small tear there, but, um, but I can do that stuff. Um, but I don't always have access to that heavy load. Like if I'm not in the gym or something and I have the time and I'm like, okay, I want to do a little bit of, you know, Achilles rehab, I'll strap that, that, uh, band on to create a little bit of a BFR effect and work to failure in a less loaded uh, scenario or situation. Yep. Um, it's kind of like you're saying, okay, so, so with those orthopedic things, um, that, like you said, that's an easy way to, to justify the use and explain the use of why we're using BFR. Um, how do you go about justifying that? And you, you sort of started to go down this periodization route of someone who maybe is like otherwise healthy and they're just wanting to use BFR for purely performance standpoints. Um, how do you typically have that conversation? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot less research there, but it, it's starting to show some promise and it makes sense um, as a, a deload strategy. I mean, it were, if you look at sports with the need for in-season management of loading, you know, it's like we we really just want to keep muscle around. If nothing else, this might be a maintenance approach to, to muscle for something like baseball or basketball or hockey, where the, the yeah. volume of games is so high and you really don't have 48 to 72 hours to recover from heavy lifting in between games. Um, so uh, there's a, a couple of studies where, you know, you look at using this as a periodization strategy where it's either offsetting weeks of lifting heavy and lifting light. Um, for me personally, as a, a broken athlete at this point in time, you know, I, I still love to lift heavy. Um, and I, I kind of use it this way for myself where it's okay, well, I'll do a, you know, some block training where I, I do, you know, a couple months of, of lifting heavy. Uh, and then I, I need a couple weeks to deload because, you know, the joints are starting to get a little bit cranky and, you know, I've sure. had a couple knee surgeries. I've, I've had, you know, uh, some broken bones across, you know, other sports other than tennis, uh, and just being dumb as a kid. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, using this as a strategy to say, okay, well, I can at least maintain gains, if not still gain a little bit of ground while doing this deload. And then you're, you're not, you know, having to ramp up so much to get back to heavy loading once you're back to the, the heavy yeah. loading training. So, yeah, I, I think that makes great sense. Like just in my head of how can we create gains without without the intensity that, you know, tears your body down where you need as much time to recover. I'm kind of, as you're talking, I'm kind of, I work with a lot of, uh, or our whole clinic for that matter. We work with a lot being out here in the Colorado area, a lot of endurance athletes, uh, yep. a lot of people that are running quite a bit or cycling quite a bit who, you know, sometimes we have people that are, they're running or marathon training or ultra marathon training six, seven days a week of running. And a lot of them don't resistance train. So that's like the right. first thing that I'm like, okay, you haven't <laughs> been lifting. Let's get you into two days a week of some right. resistance training. But then as we're, you know, we're tapering down for some of these races and things, there may, may be a um, very logical way to like incorporate the BFR to maintain those muscular adaptations without the, the fatigue and the demand tissue trauma that's, um, that's placed from some of this heavy lifting. Um, 
that maybe we could get some of these runners behind because they're always, you know, concerned and afraid if they're not someone who's regularly in the gym of I'm going to be too sore to run. And yep. all I care about is running. So, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I see the concerns of, you know, uh, the soreness perspective of, is this going to impact my, my other training? And then also, you know, they're trying to do whatever they can to not put on excessive lean mass, right. Uh, because, you know, their, their weight is a concern for totally. their events that they're training for. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I definitely think this, this could have big potential for the resistance training profile for somebody that's an endurance athlete. And then, uh, just like you said, the, the taper prior to a race where you're trying to keep the training effect high, but the training volume a little lower, you know, as a necessary way to prepare for the energy demands of the event. Um, so I, I think that that could definitely have some, some promise there. So I, I don't know that anyone's done any real research looking into that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the effects of the research that are there on the endurance side are really interesting and could give some, some potential, benefit to the endurance athlete. Yeah. And we see, we see sometimes in the clinic, we'll use a, um, a bike ergometer while the person has, has BFR on, we'll use those as like test retest scenarios. And man, do we, do we see some, some quite noticeable improvements, um, not just in the objective number, but even in what the person, you know, feels when you take that off and how, how, you know, they feel like their strength and then their endurance is on the bike of doing these like one minute tests or four minute tests of, you know, how, how much power or distance can they produce in that allotted time span? Mm. Um, we're seeing some good benefits. We're actually, we're using it quite a bit. Um, you know, with some of our CrossFit athletes our our highly competitive CrossFit athletes who, who are the same as that running conversation we just talked about, not necessarily concerned with the lean mass. Um, but you know, they're training a lot and they're trying to recover quickly in between um, heavy training sessions so that they can be prepared for their competitions. And how can they just give themselves as much benefit as possible without breaking themselves down too much? Right. Yeah, for sure. That's, yeah. uh, that, that's the way, you know, I, I think a lot of people are, are approaching this from a performance standpoint is mm-hmm. just, is this a, a strategy where I can just keep inching myself forward? Because, you know, for the, the athlete, it's a much smaller percentile change that's available to them than the untrained person. You know, it's yeah. be great if we could all keep adapting the way we did when we first started exercising. Yeah. Yeah, the, exactly. The, the effect that we're all chasing it at this point, I guess. It's like, it's like the carbon shoe thing, right? It's like, those make such little changes. You can make so much bigger percentage of change through a lot of other things besides going and buying the 200 or $300 pair of carbon, carbon running shoes. Um, well, this, this has been great, Ben. Um, you're much more the expert on BFR than, than I. So if somebody listening to this wanted to, you know, reach out to ORS or, you know, find out more about BFR science and things, how can they, um, find you guys online and, and get a hold of you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the best place to find us is is through our website. You know, we've got OwensRecoveryScience.com. We have some research on the website uh, as well as blogs and, and our own podcasts that we put out. Uh, we do have some social media uh, as well, and you could pretty much search Owens Recovery Science on any platform and find us. Uh, Got to give a, a shout out to Kyle that manages all of our social media. He he keeps us. Uh, as relevant as we are on those platforms. And so he does a great job of, of putting some good stuff out there. Um, and yeah, I mean, if, if you end up uh, reaching out, you're welcome to submit a, a contact through our website and we'll, we'll happily share more information if, uh, if we have anything that's relevant to your questions. Awesome. Well, all you guys that tuned in to listen to this episode of The Code with Dr. Ben Weatherford with Owens Recovery Science, thank you for your time. Ben, thank you for your time. And we'll put all that information that Ben just laid out in the show notes so that you guys can find it and you can find um, out any of the BFR information you want online. Hope you guys have an awesome rest of your day and we'll catch you next time on the code. Thank you so much. See you, Ben. See you.